Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to think about how geology affects the world in which we live. So this is going to correspond to section 1.1 of your textbook. So this is going to be a two slide presentation. In this first slide we're going to look at how geology affects where people settle and on the second slide we're going to start thinking about how geology has an effect on commodities that we need to survive like metals and oil for instance. So let's begin by thinking about how does geology influence where we live. So we're going to start by looking at the picture that we can see on the screen. Now if we look at the picture we can quite clearly see that we have two distinct terrains. At the back of the image here you can quite clearly see we have a mountainous terrain and that's going to have its own set of advantages and disadvantages and in the foreground we have a floodplain and once again that's also going to have its own advantages and disadvantages and we're going to think about some general ways in which geology is going to affect these different terrains and you know how that has an effect on whether we would like to live there or not. So to begin with, the mountainous terrain in the back of the image obviously consists of uh, elevated terrain and it's going to have lots and lots of steep slopes, which are going to be very difficult when it comes to things like buildings. So it's not a particularly advantageous place to live. Now, the mountainous terrain, though, does offer some benefits. So mountainous terrain will be a region where you'll often get quite heavy amounts of rainfall. And so this will mean that a vast majority of rivers will often be associated with um, uh, rain falling in mountainous regions, and that will all be focused onto a, into a river. Or it can be rainwater uh, is deposited in the mountainous terrain, it enters the rocks of the mountainous terrain, and it moves through the rocks, through a porous layer of rock, which we refer to as an aquifer. And the aquifers will often appear down at the bottom of the mountain range down here, and the water will literally come out of the rock, and some aquifers will then lead to form rivers. A classic example would be the River Thames, which is the largest river in the United Kingdom. So the steep mountainous terrain is, is pretty terrible for building on, but it does have advantages in the fact that it encourages rainfall to be deposited in those areas, and that's obviously going to help the, uh, the surrounding area because that's going to encourage the water that's deposited in this mountainous terrain to be spread out over the surrounding area via rivers. Of course, where we have steep slopes, we obviously have the risk of rock falls and landslides. Now, this is something that we also have to take into account. So the fact that the ground is naturally unstable in these areas, because they tend to have quite high rates of erosion, that means the rocks can become weakened quite quickly, and this can lead to large landslides. In geology, we sometimes refer to them as mass flows. And obviously, if you're living on the area that became part of the landslide, or if you're living in the path of the landslide, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So that's obviously another reason why living in mountainous terrain on the whole isn't considered a positive. Now, in this particular mountainous terrain, we have a volcano, and we can actually see in this image the volcano is actively erupting. Now, once again, volcanoes are, by their very nature, extremely hazardous, so you tend not to uh, live near them in case there's a very large eruption because in some cases if you get a very big eruption it can lead to certain hazards like pyroclastic flows which is a, a huge flow of superheated gas and dust which comes hurtling down the side of the volcano at sometimes hundreds of miles an hour or you can also obviously have the danger of lava flows. Now, volcanoes aren't all bad, though. The lava flow and the ash, lavas and the ashes which are deposited are very, very rich in certain elements. And so these volcanic soils, which form as the volcanic rocks get broken down due to erosion, are extremely productive. So they're absolutely wonderful for farming. And so, yes, volcanoes are a very dangerous place to be, but if you're a farmer and you want to get very good yields, having farmland on the, on the sides of a volcano can often be advantageous to you because you'll, you know, you'll get the most for your crops. And so, you know, you need to bear that in mind. Once again, it's all about pros and cons. Now, you can see here we ha actually have what looks like a crack 
running along the edge of the high ground here and you can see it comes around here it gets hidden there obviously goes underneath the landslide here and here's the other side of it there and you can actually see in this cross section that what we have are two pieces of rock one of them grey one of them in this kind of orange brown color here and you can see they're moving relative to each other so this orange brown block here is dropping down relative to the grey block and this is resulting in what's called a fault scarp which looks like a step on the surface of the earth and this is one of the things that geologists can look for in satellite imagery for instance and we can use it to try and pick out where a fault is located if you want to see a really good example of some fault scarps uh, look at the san andreas fault in california go to google earth type in san andreas fault and you'll be able to see where the san andreas fault goes in some cases because you can see the gouge that it leaves on the surface of the earth it's quite impressive actually now obviously earthquakes uh, are associated with fault movement and so building your settlement near a large fault is once again going to be a little bit hazardous to say the least because there is the chance there could be a large earthquake and that could obviously lead to substantial property damage and loss of life and so geology is going to affect whether we want to live in those areas as well now in the foreground here we are going to be in the floodplain area now geology in this case is going to affect the type of soil that we have so in this area up here in the mountainous terrain where we have very very high rates of erosion it's going to produce large amounts of sediment and this sediment's going to be eroded it's going to be transported out of the mountainous terrain and it's going to be deposited into onto the floodplain Typically, the further the sediment is transported for, the finer the little pieces of rock within the sediment will be. And so the soil close to the mountain range will often be quite coarse, it will be quite, uh, quite rough, but it will often drain quite well. Typically though, the further you go from the source of the sediment, the sediment, uh, the class will often get smaller and the sediment will often become more clay rich. And so this leads to a, a heavier soil, but that soil tends to retain water quite a lot better. So the distance over which your sediment is being transported will affect the type of soil that you have. We also have the type of soil being affected by the rocks which are being eroded. So if we were to erode one of the rocks you're probably already familiar with, something like a granite, it, that's the rock that tends to get used on people's uh, kitchen counters, um, that's going to give us a soil with a very distinctive chemistry. In contrast, if we were to erode something like a limestone, for instance, limestone consists of calcium carbonate, well, when we erode that rock, it's obviously going to produce a sediment that's going to be very, very rich in calcium carbonate. So we're going to get different rocks eroding, producing soils with different chemistries. Sometimes these chemistries will be advantageous and sometimes these chemistries will not be advantageous. And so that can encourage or discourage plant growth. We also, of course, need to think about rivers. So obviously we've discussed already how rivers will tend to be associated with areas of elevated terrain, because that's where we typically get the highest amounts of rainfall. And so obviously that's where the water is going to collect. It's going to be channeled into a stream and that stream is eventually going to grow hopefully into a river. Now, rivers themselves are extremely useful. When you look at the map of human settlements, you'll notice that a lot of the very large ones are located on rivers because that is, of course, before the advent of the internal combustion engine, the easiest way to get from place A to play, uh, point A to point B was using a river. It was just the most cost efficient method. And so lots of large settlements are associated with rivers. It also happens that the sediment which is deposited when a river floods tends to be very very nutrient rich so it's great for growing crops in and so we have a river as a source of transport for moving materials along it's obviously going to be a source of water and also when it floods it's going to help to produce a very fertile soil which is going to be great for growing your crops in so rivers tend to be quite good places to live on the other hand though they are also hazardous it's not uncommon for rivers to flood and this can once again lead to property damage and it can lead to uh, loss of life in some cases.
Now, you're probably thinking, well, how does geology affect rivers? Well, it just so happens that rivers, when they initially uh, work out their path, will tend to exploit layers of weak rock. So if you think about it, if you have a very hard rock that's very resistant to erosion, well, over time, it's not going to erode very quickly. If next door to that, you're going to have a soft rock, well, that's going to erode much faster. And so over time, what's going to happen is the soft rock will erode, and that's going to produce a topographic low. You're going to have a, a raised area made of the hard rock that erodes very, very slowly, and a lower area that's you know, underlain by the soft rock that erodes very, very fast. And naturally, the river will follow the topographic low. And so it's not uncommon to see rivers which will follow distinctive layers of rock, or in some cases they may even follow faults, which you can't see because obviously the river's on top of them, but geologically we know they're there. And so geology does have a control over the path of the rivers as well. So now let's think about the distribution of resources. So we can see clearly we have a map of North America and we have two different sets of circles. We have some blue circles and some orange circles. Now the blue circles here represent iron mines where we will mine iron ore typically for steel making. The orange circles are uh, mines where we mine copper. And obviously that will once again be set up for smelting to be used in copper wire, for instance, you know, for electrical uh, transmission. Now, in terms of the distribution, you can quite clearly see that a lot of these blue circles are located in this region up here. And you can see the boundary marked out here in red, whereas a substantial quantity of the orange circles are located in this region. And you can see the boundary marked out here in purple. So the question becomes, well, why is this the way it is? Why do we have this distribution? Well, the area marked out here with the red boundary is an area of what's called the shield. So this is the oldest crust in North America. It's not just thousands or millions of years old. This rock is billions of years old. OK, so this is very old rock here. Now, it just so happens that around 2.5 to 2 billion years ago, the Earth underwent a very substantial change in its atmosphere. Before about 2.5 billion years, the Earth's atmosphere was extremely oxygen poor, so there wasn't much oxygen in it. After 2.5, the atmosphere became very oxygen rich. And as we transition from this oxygen poor to oxygen rich atmosphere, what happens is, is the amount of oxygen increasing encourages iron, which was dissolved in the seawater, to exit the seawater and form solid minerals. So it precipitated out of the seawater and it formed these huge layers of iron mineralization, which we call banded iron formations. And this process could only occur once. It could only occur about 2.5 to 2 billion years ago. And so what we notice is all of these very, very large iron deposits are associated with rocks which are 2.5 to 2 billion years old. And where are we going to find those very old rocks? We're going to find them in the Canadian Shield. In contrast, the area over here, which is full of the orange circles, is an area of much younger terrain. So we know that this is an area that's undergone active mountain building because we, you know, we know that this is the region that includes the mountain range, which we call the Rockies. So this is an area that's undergone an orogenic event, a mountain building event. And as part of this mountain building event, the oceanic crust over here to the west of North America is being pushed underneath North America. So the oceanic crust is being pushed down into the Earth's mantle. It's melting or it's causing the Earth's mantle to melt. That obviously produces magma and magma rises to the surface. And this magma happens to contain larger than normal amounts of copper dissolved in it. And so when the magma cools and solidifies and forms solid minerals, some of those minerals it forms will be copper minerals. And so if you happen to find an area in your orogenic belt where you have a higher than normal concentration of copper minerals, then obviously that means you ha might have a rock which you can mine to make money. And so we can see that geology is broadly controlling the, two, the distribution of these two very important resources. OK, that's it for section 1.1. Please remember, do read the textbook as well. All right. Thanks, everyone.